When I was in elementary school, my after-school routine looked something like this. Get off the bus around 3 p.m., plop down in the living room to do my homework, quickly and breezily choosing to leave question marks in the math problems I thought would take more than two minutes to complete. <laughs> Have a snack, a granola bar, some yogurt, Cheerios sans honey nut because my mother was of the health intensive variety. And by 5.30 or 6 p.m., I'd sign on to the computer and log into my favorite alternate universe and the only place where I felt powerful, RuneScape. My best friend, she would know to be done with her homework and her chores by the same time so that she could sign in and join me. Christina and I grew up two towns away from one another in northern New Jersey, and we did practically everything together. We went to different schools, but a few times a week, my babysitter would pick me up from school. We'd take the bus to Christina's house so she and I could sit and do homework together. We traded CDs, sitting in the floor across from one another, passing our Walkmans and our headphones back and forth to share our favorite songs. When Christina's youngest sister was brought home from the hospital after she was born, I was there, in the, in the living room alongside her grandparents and her cousins, waiting for the opportunity to hold her and say, welcome to the family. Christina and I would go back and forth playing different computer games when we hung out. Escape rooms, Neopets, Miniclip, and the like. It was 2005, and this was the apex of great stuff to do when you were absolutely not going to the library again. <laughs> it was a day just like this, like any other, really, the day that we discovered RuneScape. It didn't take long for this virtual playground to become our favorite pastime, a part of our daily routine. In fact, it was always the best part of my day, signing into our world, which happened to be server 84, checking my friends list to see Christina's name and knowing we were, no we were minutes away from meeting up in the bustling town center of Lumbridge. RuneScape was essentially an early predecessor to World of Warcraft. There were vampires and druids, unicorns, evil wizards and towering fortresses and sea monsters. It was truly a place where almost any fantasy creature you could imagine already had an incarnation. Christina and I loved every corner of this universe. Depending on what any of our dozens of online friends wanted to do on a particular day, we might fight scorpions in the sprawling deserts of Al-Qarid, barter for precious stones to forge into jewelry, or break into heavily guarded fortresses and try not to get destroyed. Sometimes we'd take it easy, hang back in the south, kill goblins for easy gold loots and cows because you could sell their hides at an awesome markup in the Varric marketplace. We were only 11 or 12 years old by this point, but we became so wrapped up in this world and so quickly that you'd swear we were ancient bearded relics of it. In a few months time, each of us logging anywhere between 20 to 40 hours a week in game, I'd leveled, which is to say upgraded by means of gaining experience points through every kill, every quest completed, and of course, every coin earned, all of my armor to rune armor. Hers was adamantine, fancy, right? And with our pockets loaded with every kind of elemental rune there was to find, we'd trudge out into our virtual playground armored by experience, familiarity, and the fresh, fearless agency of childhood. The truth is, that even with our firm sense of familiarity, we were still susceptible to having things go wrong. Little did we know that our understanding of the constraints of in-game enemies had no bearing whatsoever on, the, our, on our understanding of the limitations of human behavior. I remember once, and distinctly, because sometimes I still get kind of down on myself for not having been smart enough to catch it, a player came up to me and told me they'd be able to level all of my black armor for me because their smithing skill was just so high. And I believed them, traded everything from my helmet to my boots to my shield, with the understanding that they would meet me later. Within seconds of handing over my every last bit of protection, they put it on and started using the different dancing taunts, <laughs> calling me a fool and a noob and thanking me for the sick gear. When I told Christina and our friend Taylor about this, Taylor lauded my thief for knowing how to pick the vulnerable ones. But he did end up buying me better armor, an apology gift for the micro-cruelties of our otherwise magnificent microverse. 
Taylor was a few years older than us at the time, 16 or 17, he'd said, and he existed as a variety of human completely unique from the ones we'd known to this point. His humor was dark, cynical, and absurdist, but he was also intensely passionate, speaking emphatically even on the most trivial things. On weekends, hours after we'd sign out of 84 telling our friends to enjoy and hey, be safe at the Chaos Temple, Christina, Taylor, and I would hang out in an AIM chat and talk about our lives. <laughs> I know that for parents, this might sound frightening and counterintuitive, but as both creature and creation of the World Wide Web, I stand by this to this day. The two closest friends I have ever had, and a handful of some of the best and brightest and most capable minds I have ever known, were people that I met on the internet. By this, I mean message boards, blog sites, fan forums, and earlier iterations of Facebook as well. These places were rife with discovery, discussion, and the dearest of friends. These places were home. Unfortunately, home for Taylor wasn't so kind. Taylor had a terrible relationship with his family, and being the eldest of five siblings, he felt certain he was the least liked. Sure, I was several years younger, and an only child, but I thought I could relate to that myself. In my tiny 12-year-old mind, my parents definitely didn't care for me very much either. They worked all the time, and half the week I'd go to sleep at night without ever getting to see them. Taylor was always sympathetic to that. I felt like he really got me. He was always eager and excited to share the details of his life with us. Here, we had found someone who immediately welcomed us into his world, the real one, with open arms and excitement. He sent us pictures of himself, his yard, his life. He was this tall, lanky, blonde boy standing in his backyard wearing a black trench coat he said was the only thing that made him feel comfortable, most himself. He spent both his days and his nights in a dark bedroom doing his best to avoid a surrounding reality which seemed to want nothing to do with him. We were perfect strangers, and yet with the way that we freely and organically shared our joys and our worries, our mishaps and our quirks, we were also family. Over time, though, he got tired of our curfews. The fact that our parents wanted us off the computer by 9.30 p.m. meant that we couldn't talk to him, even though with the time difference, it wasn't as late in Texas as it was in New Jersey, and his parents didn't care what he did anyway. We exchanged phone numbers to appease him. Christina and I had recently gotten those tiny rudimentary flip phones so that our parents, mine especially, could reach us after school, and I recall so many nights with the covers pulled all the way over my head that I spent in a three-way conversation with the two people who knew me best. It took a long time for Christina and I to stop understanding Taylor as merely a product of misfortune. We would regularly hear his parents screaming at him on the phone, the storm of their words always followed by his own account of how much they neglected him in favor of his siblings. We felt bad that he'd been kicked out of high school and felt abandoned, forced to spend his days alone at home creating refuge landscapes online. But Sometimes we'd meet up in 84 and he'd be angry at us for abandoning him all day while we were at school. Either the result of increasing loneliness or emotional dependence, Taylor seemed to be needing more and more of us. When we trudged through RuneScape, he always wanted to be involved in whatever it was we were doing, even though our other virtual friends complained that he was annoying and always trying to control our activities. A few of our friends ended up moving to different worlds, and one told us to come and find them once we'd figured out what to do with our sad, weird dog. <laughs> At the same time that this was happening, in our late-night conversations, we were seeing Taylor's language become increasingly more violent and scathing. Something was bothering him, and Christina and I had no way of knowing whether it was something bigger or if it was really just us who had wronged him somehow. He talked about hating the entire world, his family especially, how things, everything, would be better if they were dead. He told us we were the only people who knew him and cared about him. We should meet up, he said. No way, we said. Our parents would never let us meet someone from the internet, we said. They don't even know we talk to people online, we said. But Taylor was persistent, and the more we said no, the more it fueled his fits of rage. Christina's cousin Yesenia, a few years older than us, was the only person we had entrusted with knowledge of our double lives as wizards and warriors. And while she knew that we had friends that we spoke to on the phone, she didn't know the full extent of it. By this point, 
Christina and I were so overwhelmed and confused and scared for our friendship that we decided to turn to her for advice. Yesenia recoiled in horror when we told her the things that he had said. Okay, anyone who talks about wanting to kill their family probably isn't someone you want to be involved with. <laughs> anyone who gets kicked out of school for, repeated, for beating someone up and repeatedly threatening them probably isn't all that cool. I mean, if nothing else, why would you want to be friends with someone who snaps at you and berates you because you can't talk to them every single second of the day? She said, I know you guys have fun in this alternate world with your friend and you want to be good to him, but in the real world, this guy is weird and wrong and you should probably stop messing with him. <laughs> the problem, of course, was that we were just kids. We had no idea how to cut ties with a friend that we cared about, a friend who had only recently re redirected their anger so that we were now at the epicenter. What reason could we cite for cutting him off when we'd otherwise promised to be there for him? We worked out a plan, one that conveniently left us completely blameless, and it was obvious, really. And had it been real, it would have also been our biggest nightmare. We'd be found out by our parents, furious they'd, forgive, they'd forbid us from ever talking to him again. We'd block him on RuneScape and tell him we weren't even allowed to play anymore. Taylor, we'd say, they put on parental controls. <laughs> we'd seem devastated. Yesenia volunteered to play Christina's mom, interrupt a phone call and tell him firsthand, no more. The plan was underway. We blocked him in-game first, that way there'd be no worry he'd see us online after the confrontation. Then, one afternoon, frantically, we started a chat and told him, Christina's parents found out we've been talking to strangers online. They opened up, her, they opened up AIM and saw her chat history and called my mom immediately. We're in huge trouble, Taylor. I don't think we can keep talking to you. You can probably guess how he responded. He immediately cursed our parents, told us they were overbearing fucks like the rest, said that we should ignore them, figure out a way to be sneakier, and carry on. We said, Taylor, you don't understand. Christina's parents are seriously angry, and my mom already grounded me for pretty much the rest of my life. We can't talk anymore. We sign off. Yesenia is sitting next to us, and we figure it'll only be a second before he he calls us. Yesenia picks up. Hello, Taylor. This is Christina's mother. I've told her repeatedly that she's never to speak to strangers online, and I will not allow this to continue any longer. You're not to call this number or communicate with my daughter again. Do you understand? Taylor is silent for a minute, and then he starts laughing, laughing so hard he's short of breath by the time he finally stops to say, are you fucking kidding me? We have him on speaker and all of us go dead silent. We have no idea what to say because he's caught us off guard and the lapse is just long enough to give us away. You guys are fucking pathetic. Pathetic. That's not your fucking mom. You're so full of shit, both of you. I should have known this was all a fucking lie. I can't believe you, my so-called friends. You don't give a shit about me. This was all just a joke to you. Of course you'd betray me just like everyone else. I should fucking kill you. Yesenia tries to steady her voice long enough to insist she's a parent and not just a 15-year-old kid. He's screaming now. Shut the fuck up. You're not fooling me. You're both lying cowards. In a last-ditch effort, she yells back not to call this number anymore and snaps the phone shut. We were terrified. Couldn't have possibly imagined it going as badly as it did. Couldn't have possibly imagined our plan being foiled so easily. Of course he called, over and over again. After three days of not answering, the calls finally stopped. After five, we started feeling like, all right, well, at least it's over. After a week, our residual nerves had subsided enough to sign back into RuneScape. How badly we'd been needing to escape from the real world to go and play in one where we felt in control. How terrible to have the place where you feel safe now feel tainted by the memory of someone once integral to that safety. We didn't tell our friends what happened. Didn't want to talk about it didn't want them to judge us for being so stupid that we'd get caught in our lie. It took Taylor two days to find us in Berthorpe. He'd made a new account and knew our habits well enough to figure out that eventually we were bound to be back at the Chaos Temple. In RuneScape at the time, while you could block someone from talking to you privately, there wasn't much you could do to keep them from following you. So that's exactly what he did. 
followed us around and told us publicly that we, were fu that we were fucking stupid for thinking we could just get rid of him, that it wasn't going to be that easy. We signed out pretty quickly, didn't bother the trying to sign back in. A few more days, maybe a week, pass. It's Sunday afternoon and I'm at home doing homework when Christina calls me in hysterics. Taylor is here. I don't know how, but he is. He just called me over and over and when I finally answered to tell him to stop, he was talking about walking down the street in town. I'm so scared. He says he just walked past the Carvel and the Walgreens and he knows where they are. I'm so scared. It takes a full five minutes for Yesenia to join the conversation and make the decision to call 911. At this point, our parents will know soon anyway, so after dispatch says they'll send someone to talk to him, we each hang up and go turn ourselves in to our respective families. In spite of how creepy, how absolutely terrifying it was that Taylor turned up in our small North Jersey County, he wasn't officially doing anything wrong. So after the police stopped him to see what he was up to, the only thing they could do was tell him to have a good day. An officer camped outside Christina's house the rest of the day while, my par while her parents had the phone lines changed and I was at home being told the details of what would be one of the longest groundings of my life. <laughs> Our mom spent a lot of time on the phone that night. And before I went to bed, I was told we'd be going over to Christina's the next evening for a discussion. As I fell asleep that night, I couldn't help but think about all of the leveling up in RuneScape I'd never get to do. <laughs> the next night, at her house, there was a lot of talk about disappointment in both of us. And for some reason, hearing that from the family of my best friend, who for so long had taken care of me and fed me and picked me up from school and welcomed me and loved me, hurt more than the same disappointment coming from my own family. We had gotten ourselves in real danger, and Christina ended up bearing the brunt of it because Taylor showed up in her town, just five blocks from her house. The understanding was that we needed to spend some time apart from one another. A few weeks, they said. Neither of us were allowed anywhere near a phone, much less a computer, so there was no chance for us to decompress about what had just happened together. A few weeks later, I heard, that Christina's, I heard news that Christina's parents made the decision to pull her out of school mid-year and homeschool her instead. When a month passed and I hadn't heard from her, I wrote her a letter that never received a reply. Just as with Taylor, who was never again a presence in my life, I never heard from Christina again. The only explanation I received was from my babysitter, her great aunt, telling me that Christina's parents just didn't think I was a good influence. My parents watched my quiet devastation, themselves questioning why her parents would so violently and permanently rip us apart, but they honored the decision. Even with the hundreds of hours Christina and I had spent strengthening ourselves against the evils of the world as a rune-plated wizard and a broadsword-wielding warrior, nothing could have prepared us for this. The characters we'd met on our quests who time and time again had told us not to believe what we see, question everything, had made less of an impact than we thought. For the dozens of times I'd been too, too bold and gotten killed in the wilderness, losing all of my belongings, my weapons, my armor, I had still not been equipped to handle losing my closest friend. For several years after that, I grappled with the thought that in Christina's mind, I had been transformed into the same variety of evil we'd once fought together. Despite knowing otherwise, knowing how eager and excited we'd both been to welcome Taylor into our lives, I couldn't help but feel as though it was I who had done too little, been a poorly prepared wizard and an even worse friend by failing to protect her. Surely, having my armor stolen under the guise of it being improved should have taught me something about vigilance and ill intent. When my grounding was finally over, months and months after I'd gotten the sense that Christina was gone forever, I'd occasionally find myself signing back into RuneScape under a new account, not to accept any quests or upgrade any skills, and certainly not to demonstrate my bravery, but just to wander our old stomping grounds. This went on until I started high school. I thought that maybe, possibly, hopefully, please God, tell me someone's username or character type or armor customization, anything might bear her resemblance. It never happened. If she was ever in Lumbridge, I did not sense her. And for all the people in the market I found trading cow hides, I'm fairly certain she wasn't among them. I've held on to the thought, though, that in some other world, neither here nor in 84, but elsewhere, 
Our runes never failed us, and our quests never endangered us, and the only thing we ever worried, ever worried about losing were the hours spent traveling to the furthest corners of the map in search of another adventure. Thank you. Thank you,